Last week, I was in, me and a few friends, were in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and had a very interesting time about with this end time prophecy conference they had. Uh, I was listening this morning to Reaching Out Ministries. How many of you listen sometimes? At least you should get up and turn it on and see. And I made a statement before I went. I, I made the program a week, like the week that I went to Minneapolis. And I told them on the radio when I was a young Christian, I read a book called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, which dramatically changed my life as a Christian. And the late great planet Earth is on the end times in the book of Revelation. We came to the meeting and Jen Markell gets up and tells us that she read a book by Hal Lindsey called the late great planet Earth that changed her life drastically. How did she listen to my program? Or somehow are we affiliated through the Holy Spirit? God moving, God speaking to people. Helen C. was basically the first guy who wrote a book describing and explaining the end times. They, they call him, he was, the, he was the, 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 basically the first guy to really open the eyes of the Christian world on the end times. And after that, of course, everybody jumped on the bandwagon. Now we got end time messages coming out of our ears in all different shapes and forms. But the question is, who has the truth? Well, the Word of God is the truth. How do you explain the truth? How do you interpret the end times? Well, I was listening to the two main speakers, which is Safati from Israel, and then we have Mr. Frog from Hawaii. And those two must have definitely listened to my messages for the last 20 years because they preached the exact same message. I was impressed. No, they just listened to the same Holy Spirit, interpreted scripture the exact same way. Mr. Fati said, Everybody's going to have eternal life. But the question is location, location, location. Once you go into eternity, where is going to be your location? There's only two. One is the eternal lake of fire, and one is the heavenly portals of glory where in the ages to come, God will show us the mystery of his grace. Unbelievable, beautiful. And all you have to do to get into that awesome and interesting place, it's very simple. How simple? The Bible teaches us, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. I'm not going to add on to that. What you need to do is study what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is to accept him as your savior. I'll go that far. God loves us and he prepared a way for us. The Bible teaches us something interesting. God says, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. And many preachers then tell you that you need to follow the teachings of Jesus. Try following the teachings of Jesus, and you'll find out what you're up against. What Jesus meant by that, he 
performed the miracle of following the law to, in every jot and tittle. He performed, he followed the law perfectly. And then he died for us on the cross, paid for our sins. So now when we accept him, we follow the law perfectly. It's not by works of righteousness that we're doing it, but by the washing and regeneration of our soul. Hallelujah. But today I'm going to be teaching on, did God leave us instructions for the great tribulation to come? We have people who teach us that we need to fill up our basements with food and water. You have to change the water every now and then because it goes stale. But food you can basically store for maybe 50 years because they have all this freeze-dried and whatever dried food that you can put into five-gallon pails and eat. But the question is, where will you hide? Where on earth will you hide from the probing eyes who are going to sniff out anybody who even dares to believe in God? The technology we have now, when we watch last week, it is impossible already to hide. The phone you have in your, in your pocket, it, even if, with no SIM card, even when it's turned off, dictates to them every step of the way you make it is fed into a data system. That's interesting. So I, so I threw my phone away. No, just kidding. I don't care if they know where I want. I want them to listen to me when I speak because I'm going to tell them about Jesus. So today I'm going to ask the question from the Word. Does God give us instruction before He pours out judgment? So before we get into this message, let's rise and ask the Lord for blessing. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you, Lord, that you will open our hearts to the scriptures of, that you have written so long ago. We thank you, Lord, that you will bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In Luke chapter 17, in verse 26, it tells us this. That's Jesus talking. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they plowed, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So what happened in the days of Noah? I'm going to give you a short form for me to read you all the scriptures. We will be here all afternoon. So I'll give you an idea what happened with Noah. Noah was told to build an ark, and he was given specific instructions on how to build that ark, how big, how wide, how high, how to cover it. Everything's there to the T, because Noah had to be in an ark that would survive the incredible flood that would cover the earth. The Bible teaches us that the earth opened itself up and water gushed out from underneath and the canopy of water that was over the earth came down at the same time. I'm telling you, that must have been a downpour. And it didn't last one day, two days. It lasted for 40 days. So God made sure that Noah would do the right thing and he gave him specific instructions, and like in the days of Noah, people were mocking him. You are out of your mind. How about in the days of Lot? I want to read you out of scripture 
We all remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. One guy once asked me, was Sodom and Gomorrah after Jesus came or before Jesus came? I said, when is the last time you read your Bible anyway? Come on. Everybody should know who claims to be a Christian that Lot was there way before Jesus was on this earth. So here's what happened in Genesis chapter 9. The angels of the Lord, they walked into Sodom. And we all know the story. The Bible teaches us the depravity of that place, the homosexuality, the, the, the child sacrificing, the, the people, archaeologists are digging out stuff that they don't even want to show the people of this world on how debased those people are. Homosexuality was just one of the things there. It's the way they treated people and everything. So God finally said, this is enough. I'm going to wipe out the whole works. I think there were five cities in that area. And when they came in, the people wanted to rape. Though, can you imagine there's two strangers coming in? The men want to rape those two angels. That's how depraved they were. And for those of you who know the story, we know how it turned out, but I will, I will show you in Genesis chapter 19. And the man said to Lot, has you here any besides? Son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spoke unto his sons-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. They thought he was a nut. Just like people today, when we warn them, get ready. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Get ready. They mocked him. They, they, they said, you must be crazy in your head. I was talking to a lady from Rwanda the other day. And how many of you know her? Uh, her name is Sarah. We had her here in church once. And we were discussing the, the genocide that she lived through in the 1990s, I think it took place, or the 80s. And 800,000 people got killed. And she said, afterwards they heard from every city, in every city, the Lord would wake people up early in the morning and they would walk up and down the street and proclaim to them, repent. Judgment is coming every morning for about a week straight. Ten, then they went back to their houses in every city. Can you imagine God doing that? Repent, judgment is coming. They mocked those people. Guess what happened? 800,000 people were hacked to death and shot to death in a matter of a couple of, maybe a month it happened. Unbelievable stuff happened there. And here's the same thing. They mocked him as he warned. What's going to happen to those people? Well, we know what happened. It says in Genesis chapter 19, And when the morning arose, and the angel hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, man, he didn't want to go. I got, just bought a big business downtown. I want to stay here. My wife has two grandchildren she got to take care of. I know all the arguments. They're good arguments, but when God tells you something, you move. And while he lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord, being merciful unto them, they brought them forth and set them without the city. 
So, church, regardless how deep you're stuck to this world, you're going to be grabbed by the arm, whether you like it or not. And God is going to lift you out of here one of these days. So pay attention. Don't hold too tight. It might rip off your arm. Hallelujah. Okay, in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 17. And when it came to pass, when they were brought forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither say thou, stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain. Least thou be consumed. Haste thee there, escape there, for I can, listen to this, I cannot do anything till you come there, till you're safe. Interesting. God had a time set for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angel of the Lord were instructed Make sure those people get out of there. Make sure Lot gets out of there. And they hastened, they, 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 they stalled till the angels grabbed them because they know the time is coming. Sorry, we can't wait for you to make up your mind anymore. We got a set time and you're leaving this place. They grabbed them and pulled them basically physically out of the city. And guess what happened to the rest of the story? It is unbelievable how God warned them. He came to warn them. He didn't tell them, go build a, a shelter underneath your house. Put some uh, food in there and water. Make sure you got a lot of water because we're going to burn this place. No, he gave them one specific instruction. Get out of here. So, when you study the Word of God, every time when God pours out His judgment, God always warns those who He loves. Who are those He loves? Those who turn to Him for salvation. They become one with Him. They become a part of the family of God, and He will not allow His family to go through his judgments. Of course, in this world, we will suffer tribulation. We will. I've experienced tribulation. I've experienced separation from my family and from, from the lifestyle I was so used to. Without hesitation, be gone. Get out of here. We don't want you here. It's not that they didn't like Dave. They didn't like the one living inside me. He was the one that was throwing the accusations. He was the one that was bringing condemnation, bringing accusations, repent, for you need to come to the Lord. No, they did, it's not that they didn't like me. They didn't like the one living in me. So as a Christian, if you're being rejected by your friends, don't think it's strange because God said that will happen to you. If they call me a devil, they'll call you worse. So get used to it. Make sure that you don't return same for same. Show them love. Show them that you love them. Don't, try to understand that their eyes are not open. They don't see what you see. And now the question is, will God warn us of the judgment that is coming? The Bible teaches us no man knows the day or the hour. We don't know when Jesus will come back. We can look at the signs of the times in Israel Everything seems to be shaping up to the time when he said he'll come. We can see earthquakes. We can see the tsunamis. We can see incredible things happening. And these are the signs of the times. So I want to share a scripture with you. Luke chapter 21 in verse 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up. Lift up your heads, for your redemption 
draweth nigh. Hallelujah. That's the instructions I'm getting. I know I got friends who are putting stuff into their basements, freeze-dried stuff. They have to exchange it every second year, but they're so confident that they'll be able to hide from the Antichrist. I once told them, you better buy some machine guns because you'll need them to protect your little stock of goodies. Man, can you imagine the horrors through the tribulation? Three and a half years, no rain. The water's all turning to blood. Vegetation all dried up. Nothing to eat. And you want to sit in your little basement with this freeze-dried good? Good luck, my friend. You're going to be found out. Not only by your cell phone, but by the demonic horde that's going to be unleashed on this planet. Where is the safest place? One guy said to me once when I told him about these things. He said, where's the safest place where we could be in Texas? I said, no. The safest place is to be in Jesus. Hallelujah. Because Jesus will come in like a magnet. We'll be drawn unto him. He said, so likewise when you see these things come to pass, Know you that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Hallelujah. What an interesting time to live in. We are on the premises of this. I don't know if I'm saying the words right. We're right at the edge of this dispensation of time. God is about getting ready to wrap things up. Those of us who watch what's going on down south can see the horrors of the godless who don't care about righteousness. God is going to someday give them exactly what they want. He's going to say, okay, you want to do it without me? Here you are. Half it. It's going to be three and a, uh, seven, and seven years long, and guess what they will be doing? they will simply exterminate one another to the point where God says if we don't come back, no flesh will be left. That's how it's going to be. That's how it is when the unregenerated heart governs itself. We can see it throughout the history. Hitler came into power. Millions and millions of people died under his his, uh, these, his jack boot that he was wearing. It, unbelievable. When you study the lifestyle of Stalin, 20 million, 25 to 30 million of his own people killed. Why? Because he believes he is a god. The people are inferior and Satan is there telling him what to do. And they do it without hesitation. Is there going to be another Stalin on this earth? Is there going to be another Hitler on this earth? Hey, these guys are kindergarten players compared to the Antichrist that is coming upon this planet. I know that for a fact when I study the Word of God. The Word of God teaches this world has seen trouble, but not like it's going to see when the Antichrist takes over. Satan himself will be brought down to this earth and he will be the mastermind here. He will be the one dictating the loss and the ways things have to go. And God will sit back and allow them to see who they are. Oh, what a horrific time. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, listen to this scripture. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man takes your crown. Let, hold on to this, Jesus. Don't allow people to turn you away, turn you this way or that way. But he promises us, because we believe in him, we trust in him, he will keep us, 
keep us from the hour of temptation, of tribulation that shall come to try them that dwell upon the earth. So God is giving us instructions. Watch, wait. When the time is right, I'm going to take you out of here. I love the way Safati puts it. He said, from the youngest kid, as a young kid, there's one thing I wanted to be. That was to be an ambassador. Ambassador to a different country where I can go and tell them about my country. Well, I became an ambassador. An ambassador for Christ. Even though you see, uh, Safad is, is an operator in Israel, sometimes I, I figure the guy is still connected or or involved with the government and with the military, the way he brings out information. Nobody knows this stuff that he knows. How does he get to find it out? He must be involved, and he gets to go ahead to bring it out. Listen to him if you want to know what's going on in the end times. And he said, I want to ask you the question. What happens to an ambassador when war breaks out? You know what the country does? It brings its ambassadors home. And we are the ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ here on this earth, telling people there is a homeland for us that is unbelievably beautiful. We are the ambassadors of Christ. That's what the Bible teaches us. But one day, those ambassadors are going to be taken out. The one holding back the evil will be taken out of the way. Then the wicked one shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his coming. So we are ambassadors. Let's wait and hope. Let's work as an ambassador. I'm telling you, we don't have much time. Feverishly, we should try and bring our loved ones to the Lord Jesus Christ. Never mind sitting back and saying, well, whatever you'll do, you'll do. That's your choice. Let's try and win them by being a good example. I want to read you one more scripture, Luke chapter 21 in verse 20, 34. There's two, three scriptures. He says, take heed to yourself. And that is written in context. In Luke chapter 21, he's talking about the tribulation. He's talking about the horrors that are to come. So at the end, he says, take heed to yourselves. Least any times your hearts be overcharged with serviting, drunkenness, the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unaware. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell upon the face of the earth. Remember, a snare is for the unaware. How many of you know what a snare, how a snare works? It's for the unaware. Those who don't care, those who don't really worry about the dangers, they just head rush, head along into it. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth, not just the Middle East like some are teaching. Oh, the tribulation will be just around the Middle East. We'll be sitting here and watching it on TV. Good luck, I'm telling you, you'll need it. It says, watch you therefore, pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all those things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's God speaking to us. He's speaking to us. Don't... If, if you know about Jesus and you put it aside, you are in for a rough time. You're going to have the Antichrist to face. Jesus made it so easy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Those who believe in his name, he says, he has given them the power to become the sons of God. Believing in Jesus as an historic figure is not enough. The whole religious world believes in an historic Jesus. But if you believe in him, if you know about him, he gives you the power to become a child of him, of the Son of God. How does that work? He paid your price. 
He paid my price that I owe. And he paid it so that we don't have to pay it ourselves. A pardon, because we are all, we all got this root of bitterness in us, inherited from Satan when Adam and Eve sold us in the garden. We have this root of bitterness that has to be replaced. And that root of bitterness can only be replaced by our Lord Jesus Christ. It, the Bible teaches us not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by the washing, the washing and regeneration of our soul. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? The Bible, te the Bible teaches us repent, be converted, that your sins may be washed away. Trying to repent, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't work. I tried it a few times before I was a Christian. I know enough that doesn't work. I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to quit swearing. Oh, yes. That worked. No, it says repent means to change your mind. Be converted. Converted into the Lord Jesus Christ that your sins may be washed away. Our sins can't be worked away. They have to be washed away. Hallelujah. How is that done? Through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the incredible blessings that God has given us. He is willing that none perish. He wants us all to enter into the kingdom of God. But alas, there are going to be people who are not going to take that as we've seen throughout the, the histories. But for us here, for those of you watching through the internet, God loves you and he wants you to enter into his kingdom. He did everything he can. The choice, though, is up to you. Hallelujah. Let the Lord open your heart to this and make you a blessing to yourself. Amen.